sociability, I guess, with other dogs? Does she go to the dog park? Is it likely that she's got, you know, something like kennel cough or whatever they call it these days? Um, that's where I'd start. Because otherwise she sounds like she's very physically well and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about kennel cough. What do we call it these days? <laughs> Does anyone know? Um, I don't know what the official term is, like infectious tracheobronchitis. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. Infectious so, tracheobronchitis. Canine cough. Canine cough. Um, there's, there's a few different kind of papers written and they, they term it differently, which is annoying. Um, sorry, I'll just double check. Someone's just sent a message. Oh. Yeah, that, that's me. My phone's about to go flat and I've just got to work. Thanks. Ah, you're on, no worries. There we go. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, the newer kind of consensus statements talking about canine infectious respiratory disease complex. So rather than kind of localizing it to um, the trachea, or bronchi, it's acknowledging that it can call, cause quite kind of profound nasal signs in some dogs and can cause pneumonia in other dogs. Um, so uh, calling it that sort of complex um, rather than, yeah, isolating it is kind of the current trend, but it doesn't really matter at all. Mm -hmm. um, so this dog socializes regularly at the dog park um, and oh yes, that's right. My mum's dog was over. She was coughing yes a couple of days ago as well. Um, what are you going to do about it? What further diagnostics do you think are warranted in this case? Um, oh, sorry, you go. I was just going to say physical examination. If you haven't already, just to listen to um, lower airway sounds because um, re I guess realistically speaking. The cough is probably originating more from like the where the cough receptors are rather than lower airways. Um, so if we can't identify anything like pyrexia or um, any kind of abnormal um, auscultation, um, then I'd probably be more, and the dog was ideally vaccinated, then I'd probably be inclined just to monitor it at first. <laughs> but yep. if we wanted to do be really thorough, then I guess we'd do um, some thoracic radiographs, um, tracheal radiographs and blood testing and stuff. Awesome. Any, um, can you expand on where the, um, where the cough receptors are, Josh? Uh, yeah, so I think they're larynx, trachea and kind of where the um, primary bronchi like bifurcate, but not any lower in the... Yeah, exactly. So the, the lowest cough receptors are pretty much at that tracheal bifurcation. So it's a really interesting point that often lower respiratory disease doesn't cause a cough. It's not until the mucus from lower respiratory disease gets up to that bifurcation that the cough then is trying to expel it from the airways. Um, so it's not till the mucus tickle, tickles the cough receptor or if you've got inflammation at the site of the cough receptor that you get a cough. Um, just go to my infectious disease complex. So say this puppy, I'm going to change the signalment. Say this puppy's six weeks old, exactly the same, generally seems well, um, but is um, coughing quite profoundly. And while, it's, while she's trying to eat, she's coughing and things, even though she wants to eat. Are you going to treat that any differently? I think there's more indication to treat under eight weeks hmm. because of the higher risk. Exactly. Risk of what? Pneumonia. Yeah, exactly. So pretty much all of the organisms that cause that infectious disease complex can have the potential to cause pneumonia. So whether it be viral or bacterial pneumonia. And even if it is viral, often the pneumonia is a secondary bacterial pneumonia as a result of the inflammation down there. So... What are you going to treat it with? A moxiclav. Good. It's a good choice. Uh, doxycycline. I would love to treat it with doxycycline, but I feel like the right answer is a moxiclav. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the teeth issue or? 
I just think the last thing I read said that the indication under eight weeks was for the amoxy and not for the doxy. I, I'm not 100% clear on the reason. I think that's probably so doxycycline where we are conservative with in growing dogs or teething dogs in particular. Um, I think either you could make an argument for either. So as an example, clav, some Bordetella organisms and all mycoplasmal organisms are resistant to clav. So we're missing a spectrum in our kind of disease complex. But then if we're sort of thinking, well, yeah, what? that's a good question, actually. What are the other organisms for that will cause, are involved in this um, disease complex? When I say organisms, I'm including viruses. Yeah, so like viral um, viral organisms as well. Yeah. Her influenza. Her influenza. Mm. Yeah. Adenovirus too. Yeah, very good. Um, so herpes as well. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, like there's a respiratory coronavirus. I don't know that I've seen that much or yeah. quite much, but. Me neither. I don't know if it's in Australia, but I, I think Max had one last year. Oh, like not last year, the year before Max didn't we? Who did? Sorry. Max, Max at North, back at North Shore, we potentially had one. Maxie, was that was mm. that right? I can't remember, maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> hmm. um, Sorry. I guess um could I put in there if I got a six week old puppy? Going back to Josh's workup, I'd be really concerned about not just infectious disease, but congenital disease and having a look at oropharynx, nosopharynx, seeing if there's a cleft palate or, or um, you know, something that's causing some... Um, dysphagia or something. Yeah, something. yeah. Yeah, that was my own initial thought as well when Anna was saying um, difficulty eating. I was thinking like, oh, we should do a swallow study. <laughs> Really good, actually. I hadn't really thought about that because I just threw it out there, but that's... Yeah, is it a French bulldog? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's exactly the right approach clinically to take, but it's just because we're talking about infectious diseases that we're yep. going straight to it. Obviously, we're giving away the answer. <laughs> um, but obviously, you do that clinically, absolutely. Um, so the other organism that should be on our radar, I think we talked about it um, at some point recently, is the influenza virus. It's exotic to Australia, but particularly in um, like a group dog situation. So like kennels or um, greyhounds who are housed together. It's, caught, it's had quite a high mortality rate in the Western coast of America, which it went through recently. Um, so certainly if, if you sort of, you know, work in one clinic, you tend to see a lot of dogs from one area. And if you're seeing really severe respiratory outbreak, I think it's worth starting to potentially, oh, I don't want to give you the answer. If you sort of start to see a trend, are you going to change your testing pattern or your diagnostic pattern? Uh, would it depend, I guess, on the severity of disease? Like if you're seeing a lot of kennel cough or... Yeah. Yeah, that's an infectious true. complex, no, but if they were really unwell, then yep. yes. Yeah, so dogs developing pyrexia and changes in appetite um, and signs of pneumonia potentially. What are you going to do? An upper respiratory PCR. Good. Yeah. Where are you going to take your sample from? Um, the base of the laser parrot, like right at the back. Good. Are you going to do it with the dog awake? No. No? Well, I'm not. <laughs> no. Um, if, they're, if you are sort of sedating them, um, doing the PCR on BAL fluid or tracheal wash fluid is definitely worth doing. So just with under a bolus of alfaxan, sterile tube in, flush catch um, is probably going to be higher yield than the back of the throat ones where if you detect mycoplasma, for example, or Bordetella, what, well, what are the limitations of the PCR? You're only, like, it's got a high rate of true positives, but um, it may have false negatives. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not picking up the DNA, then you're not going to get a positive result, even if it's there. Absolutely. Um, 
you might isolate them in like clinically clinically normal dogs absolutely yeah so there's a percentage of, of dogs and cats who carry bordetella as a commensal um so it's not always pathogenic um the interesting point i read um yesterday was that the viruses that we're testing for so the ones that we talked about all shared very early in the course of disease so sometimes before clinical signs are even shown and by the time you're actually doing the PCR, it's coming back negative. So it's actually quite low yield, um, but it is really the only kind of molecular diagnostic test we have for respiratory disease. So I think it's still worth running, particularly if we're seeing kind of clusters of cases. Um, I definitely wouldn't do a PCR in like the first case that was clinically well and was in isolation. Um, so what about same dog and this time instead of having a one day history of coughing, it's got a 10 day history of coughing. How does that change things? I guess initially I want to know is this progressive or not? Um, and again, how is the dog otherwise? Um, did it start off well and now it's progressing, getting worse and inappetent? anorexic so forth um are we the six week old puppy now or are we back to the eight month old the eight month old one sorry sorry um so the the dog's starting to have trouble sort of keeping food down so you often retch and regurgitate after eating associating with coughing um and the owner's very concerned and there's a temperature of like 39 what are you going to do? I think I'd be doing I this. Do radiographs. Yeah. Absolutely. I look for things like even like mega esophagus and stuff like that as a Absolutely. potential trigger for like aspiration. Good. Yeah. Good thinking. Um, what do you know about mega esophagus with this canine infectious disease complex? Nothing. <laughs> no. <that's laughs> not, there's nothing really published about it at all. Um, I once spoke to Georgina Child about this because I, I was in general practice and I was seeing a run of kennel cough and we were radiographing a few of them for some reason and a lot of them had a mega esophagus or because they were regurgitating with, with eating uh, and a lot of them had, had a mega esophagus and I called Georgina and just said, this doesn't make sense. These are young, healthy dogs with no pyrexia, just this cough and regurgitation. What's going on? And she goes, oh, yeah, that's definitely a thing. It's just not written down anywhere. So um, the, she thinks it's just aggravation of the nerves supplying the esophagus with the constant changes in, like dra dramatic changes in, in intrathoracic pressure. Oh. Um, so not uncommon to see a mega esophagus associated with a really severe tracheal cough um, where they're really honking and really forcing and often with that terminal retch at the end. So I just thought that was interesting until... Um, and in those cases with the mega esophagus, obviously much more likely to breach for antibiotics because the risk of aspiration is so much higher. But as far as a workup for mega esophagus, I probably would hold off until the cough resolves before I started any kind of acetylcholine receptor antibody testing or anything. Um, so... What about kind of, I mean, we're all pretty comfortable with kennel cough, aren't we? Can we move on to something more interesting? Is there any new, anything new on the treatment spectrum rather than just treating the owner because if they're <laughs> driving them crazy, having their dog bark all the time, anything Yeah, new I'd there? be interested in um, <clears throat> when you know that it is infectious respiratory disease, appropriate cough suppressant. Um, yeah, it's indicated. Such a good question. It's definitely not mentioned in the paper I just read that was looking at treatment, but that was the focus on antimicrobial stewardship and when it's appropriate to use antibiotics. So I think that's probably omitted from that rather than like it just was kind of off topic. Yeah. Um, it's a really good question though, using cough suppressants in these patients. I don't think we should... Yeah, because I was wondering as well, um, don't they, like with the, even with these viral infections, can they affect the mucociliary escalator as well um, with inflammation? Absolutely. I read something in Edinburgh about it, but 
Um, yeah. Um, so why would you then not suppress cough in these patients? They guys would be a bit more worried that if there's already decreased clearance of mucus and we're relying on a cough to try and clear any kind of mucus buildup or um, so potentially productive cough, we wouldn't want to suppress that any further. Yeah. But anyway, but I don't know if that's the thought. Yeah. It's a really, I, I find it a really interesting topic because my instinct is that coughing causes inflammation, which predisposes to infection. So I think that's one sort of tick for cough suppression. And certainly in humans, the pharmacists are always like, don't suppress the cough, don't suppress the cough, it's high risk. And, you know, when you've got an upper respiratory thing going, cough going on, um, high risk for pneumonia, but clinically you get better if you do that. Like you feel better sooner if you do that. So I think there's, there is definitely an argument for it. I think we just don't have the controlled studies to say whether it's safe or not. But I think there's also a more cautious approach of first do no harm, I didn't prescribe cough suppressants and therefore it's not my fault if it didn't get better fast enough. <laughs> um, so that's probably the conservative approach, but I don't, I don't think it would be wrong to use like something like meropotent, which has got some cough suppressant qualities. Um, whereas something like codeine, which will cause potentially sedation as well as cough suppression might be a little bit heavy handed. It, it, or if you did use codeine, go for an ultra low dose or something like that. Isn't yep. there a genetic ciliary dyskinesia? I can't remember the name of it. There is. It's called ciliary dyskinesia. <laughs> uh, uh, there is. Do you know what that would manifest as? Uh, no, but I guess it um, probably a chronic cough and um, uh, build up of mucus in the in the uh, respiratory system. Absolutely. Quite often come in with nasal discharge as their presenting sign because they've lived with reduced lung function their whole life. Um, and it's not until they get a secondary infection that they become really unwell and often they present with a nasal discharge before that. Um, do you know how you diagnose that? Uh, again, no, pathology? but I would suspect it would be by biopsy. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's impossible. So biopsy and then electron microscopy to determine that the stiff arm in the middle of the cilia is not formed right, essentially. So it's really hard to diagnose. Um, but interestingly, a huge percentage of dogs with primary ciliary dyskinesia, which is the genetic malformation of the cilia, have situs inversus. So their oh. organs will be flipped around. So if you do like a DV radiograph and their colon's on the wrong side or their heart points in the wrong direction, then that would be a really strong indicator that that's what you're dealing with. Fascinating. It's really, really cool. cool. Really cool. <laughs> uh, I've never seen it, but I'm real, I look for it. <laughs> We had one of those dogs in junior surgery when I was in school that was just like for a spay. Oh, wow. And when, that group, when that group opened her up, everything was on the wrong side. I didn't see wow. it. Wow. That's so cool. That must have been, the, the clinician must have just been dying. <laughs> That's one of those once in a lifetime cases, I think. Mm -hmm. And on a slightly different subject, I'm a great fan of bromhexane by Solvin. Oh, yes, for muc as a mucolytic. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I've had mixed um, mixed responses to that. I've got so many people that, like, are referred and are already on it for both um, bron chronic bronchitis and chronic, like, idiopathic rhinitis. Um, and in some, some people swear by it and other people, the mucus gets so sticky that they can't clear it because it gets thick. Um, but I don't know, I haven't seen any like prospective good studies on whether it actually works or not. It's all anecdotal. Yeah, I think that's right too, actually. Mm. But um, interesting on a very side effect, I, um, I had a, a client who was a, a nurse in a human fertility clinic once and they were using it to increase semen volume in men with, with that problem. <laughs> um, but I notice when I use it myself and I've got a cold, um, 
when, when uh, I'm irritated, you know, the nasal discharge will be profuse and watery. And then when the cold settles down, um, uh, then it stops. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so you think it, it increases, the like it liquefies the mucus, do you think? Well, in my case, it certainly does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Well, that yeah. makes it. But that's only an individual anecdote, though, unfortunately, and, and in a different species. Yeah. Uh, that's true. <laughs> so we've just got to extrapolate, though, don't we? We just take the information we can get. Uh, okay, I'm going to go on to something a bit more interesting. So can someone tell me what the lower respiratory tract is? Like which parts of the respiratory tract encompass the lower respiratory tract? Uh, the bronchioles and alveoli and pulmonary parenchyma, I guess. Excellent. <laughs> um, and the trachea. Is actually part of the lower. Okay. Yeah. The whole of the trachea or just the oh. intrathoracic part? Yeah, so the whole of the trachea. Hmm. I know. Yeah. I, was, I was kind of surprised at that. So that's why I'm talking about infectious disease complex in the lower respiratory tract talk. But um, all right, I think I worked out how to share my screen. Sorry, Josh, do you reckon you can do some waiting music for while I'm digging around with my computer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do that, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Josh, you're going to have to sing. Yes. Oh, you definitely don't want that, guys. <laughs> Show them the cat. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. <laughs> he's going to somewhere. Um, the next room. What can you guys see right now? Your screen. The whole screen? Yeah. yeah. Everything. Okay, all right. That's probably going to be better. I apologise for my desktop. It's chaos. Um, okay, so let's go. Let's go this radiograph. Tell me about this radiograph. <clears throat> There's too much increased opacity in the thoracic cavity, Excellent. especially ventrally, mm -hmm. and it's displacing the lungs dorsally. Good. Excellent. What's the and the trachea dorsally as well. Mm, I agree, it's floating. Mm. It's loss of cardiac silhouette. Mm -hmm. Border effacement, mm -hmm. we could mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Yep. Air aphasia. Yeah, good. Probably from dyspnea. Yeah. Um, what do we think about the lung margins, the shape of them? Round. The low bar. Rounded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. So they're very rounded. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to do too much radiographic analysis because Mariana might see this and go, oh, what are we doing? Uh, that's my gig. Um, but what's, um, given we're talking about infectious diseases, what do you think is kind of, um, what would be your radiographic conclusion here? Could be looking at pyosorax. Yeah, absolutely. So I said this all. looks looks like a bit of gas in the cranial thorax as well, like free gas even potentially. Right. It doesn't yeah. look like that. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Where does this dog live? It's a cat. It's a cat. It's a cat. Good heavens. There's a difference, is there? This is Jeff! A... <laughs> this is a North Shore cat. Okay, so where does the cat live? Uh, on the North Shore, lower North Shore. Fence. Yeah, okay, not in the Riverina. <laughs> but yes, it's not a grassy, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the reason I asked you what the lower respiratory tract encompasses is because it doesn't encompass the pleural space, but I didn't know when else to talk to you about pyothorax apart from in the lower respiratory tract infectious disease talk. So I thought we'd just cover that first. <laughs> um, so this cat has obviously a pleural effusion. What are the causes? And then we tapped its chest and it came back as a... Um, um, mucoparalent, no, not mucoparalent. What is it? Pi, um, exudate. Yeah, that's the word. Thanks. <laughs> Septic exudate. That's the word. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so it's come back as pyothorax essentially. What are the most common causes of pyothorax in a cat? 
think it's um, either hematogenous spread of bacteria mm -hmm. um, or direct inoc inoculation of bacteria. But, um, I guess I think a lot of the time you can't really identify where it came from. Mm -hmm. I guess you could probably say idiopathic, but probably hematogenous. Yep. Um, when you say direct inoculation, how what inoculates it? So either um, penetration from the thoracic wall, um, penetration from the esophagus, or direct extension from the lungs. So something like um, pneumonia directly extending into the pleural space. Very good. Yeah. But I think that's still kind of questionable. Is that right? Um, no, it's definitely. Um, demonstrated extension of bacterial pneumonia into the pleural space. Um, more, so, more so in dogs than cats, actually, just because cats don't get bacterial pneumonia very often. Um, when I sort of say what inoculates it, you mentioned through the thoracic wall. What goes through the thoracic wall? Um, like a, a trauma or do you mean like a, so like a, I mean, I guess it's less with cats, but like stick injuries or a bite from a cat, another cat. That's what I'm after. Oh, like a cat fight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, or claw, potentially. Um, and the reason why that's so significant is because the bacteria that we see in feline pyothorax is different from the bacteria we see in canine, because actually the most common presentation in a cat is a bite wound um, as a cause. Like oral flora. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so knowing what um, oral flora are, and that that's the most common cause of pythorax in cats, what are the most common bacteria? Uh, pasteurella. Good. And a broad category of bacteria. Like arrows. Great. Pharyngeal bacteria. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the pleural space is not very well oxygenated, so it doesn't have great blood supply, so anaerobes can really take off in there. And pasturella grows quite well in there as well. So they're the two most common causes of pyothorax in cats. So once you've tapped this chest, you know there's pus in there, you know that that's the most likely kind of groups of bacteria in there, what's the treatment going to involve? Emergency stabilization initially, so oxygen and draining the fluid mm -hmm. to allow the lung tissue to expand. Yeah. And then um, the culture and sensitivity and analysis of the fluid, but probably like empirical antibiotics mm -hmm. while you're waiting for that. What are you going to choose? Um, I'd probably use caramoxiclav, something broad spectrum, but that's got good anaerobe cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How are you going to administer it? intravenously good yeah excellent so it's really important to get parenteral antimicrobial coverage at least until you kind of documented the pus is decreasing in volume um so clab's a good choice because it covers the anaerobes but it doesn't um in fact it's just a good choice full stop great <laughs> would, you add, um, would you add another thing do you tend to treat those that, like with another thing specific for anaerobes and then scale back if needed? I was really interested to see the consensus statement say that the best combination of medications is uh, fluoroquinolone as an empirical choice in okay. pyothorax specifically is a fluoroquinolone um, and plus a penicillin essentially um, and they or clindamycin so you can switch out penicillin for clindamycin if you've got access to IV clindamycin. Um, I don't normally use, reach straight for a fluoroquinolone, particularly because we don't, because they've got IV marbofloxacin overseas and pravofloxacin. So I think they've got better options for cats overseas, but certainly IV and rafloxacin makes me really nervous in cats. Why? An onset of blindness. Exactly, yeah. Um, I worked with an ophthalmologist who um, told me that if she ever saw me using enrofloxacin in a cat again, that she'd report me to the board herself. 
Yikes. <laughs> um, and wouldn't ENRO would not cover the anaerobes, but some of the other fluoroquinolones can, like Virofox and Protofox, right? Yes. Yeah, so this consensus statement actually said Protofox is an, is an excellent single agent choice. Mm. Um, so that's whilst obviously we try and keep fluoroquinolones up our sleeve and there's very few indications to use them as a empirical choice, this is the one. And Pratofloxacin would cover the anaerobes quite well, whereas Enrofloxacin you must pair it with uh, um, clindamycin or penicillin to cover the yep. anaerobes. What about uh, chest tubes, continuous mm. suction drainage? So right. some time ago, there was a paper from Sydney Uni only on about five or six cases, I think, where they, they uh, maintained that bilateral uh, continuous, well, I'm not sure about continuous suction, but um, in, uh, bilateral chest tubes were very successful for them. Yeah, mm. absolutely. So um, uh, indwelling chest tubes, whether they're unilateral or bilateral, so some cats have got the communication in their mediastinum, so you can put the drain in one side and it gets through to the other side. Um, but most of the time, pyothorax, the stuff is so thick that you've got to get the two drains in because you're never going to get full drainage from one side to the other side um, to be able to drain it properly. Um, outcomes without indwelling chest drains are pretty poor, with indwelling chest drains around about 90% recovery rate. Um, they recommend, in the consensus statement, they just recommend either continuous suction or intermittent suction. And the panel that they asked, so there's 18 specialists who deal mostly with respiratory disease, um, when they asked them whether they thought lavaging was appropriate, there was no consensus on that. So there's not enough the saline lavaging. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and they said there's no indication that intracavitary antimicrobials change the outcome. So that's sort of been used previously. We had long discussions on this when I was at uh, uh, in uh, CSU and uh, the uh, end result was that um, because leukocytes work best on surfaces you were best not to lick, not to float them around and uh, but, well because that's probably an older idea when um, when I did my residency in the 80s we definitely did not lavage them and we used continuous suction drainage yeah you're right how did you how did you do like did you have a continuous suction machine just attached or did you have like a negative pressure syringe or uh, now the continuous suction was a, a plastic module thing that was specifically designed for that right. and, and hooked up uh, and just using a, um, a 20 centimetre height a column of water. It was effectively a three bottle suction, but in a, um, and I think I've got a photo of it somewhere, um, a three bottle suction in, um, uh, you know, in a, in a more fancy setup, I guess. Mm. So you just uh, you just plugged it into the wall and uh, the other end into the animal, and uh, it collected the discharge without without it going into the suction unit. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, yeah, we certainly use continuous suction with our pneumos, with a particularly tension pneumothoraxes that just are filling up every time the animal breathes in. Um, but I've never used it with pyothorax. I never sort of thought to. But there's certainly cats that we're having to drain quite frequently. And that's maybe the luxury of having a 24 hour facility that we have people to do that through the night and stuff. Um, so the only, only indication for lavage, I think, is if the pus is so thick that you're not draining it. So if you're looking with the ultrasound and there's still fluid in there and you're kind of just getting plugged catheters, then in that situation, I'd lavage with just some body temperature saline, um, but no additives. And um, our anaesthetist actually was talking us through uh, local anaesthetic because obviously plural space disease is reportedly in humans they say it's so painful um, so it wouldn't be the wrong thing to look at doing a local anaesthetic block through that drain if you've got the drain access and you can improve like not use so much sort of systemic pain relief um, and just use local that would be preferable um, but that's obviously dependent on the patient. Is that like just a splash block? You're putting it through the tube and 
rolling the cat around and okay yeah, exactly we never actually got the um actual protocol did we josh did you talk to keely about that no uh, she's in surgery like all day so I missed no. her. Yeah. Uh, we might try and pin her down on that and let you know but it was um she said do you say hi that we miss her at csu uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry not sorry i love you <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah, I'm maybe I'm old school. I do lavage them and I rock the cat side to side and front to back. And you know, yep. that whole the solution to pollution is dilution. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, whether that has any effect or negative effect, I don't know, but it's hard to unlearn something. Yeah, for sure. And I, do, I think it's also, I mean, so often we're bound by what our patients are like. Like mm. if you had to sedate the cat every time you did that, then you probably wouldn't be doing yeah. it. Yeah. Whereas if the cat's quite amenable to it, then it's, it's probably not going to do any harm. Mm -hmm. um, when you're when you've got chest strains in, how are you going to decide when how long to leave them in for? Uh, I guess it depends on how much you're aspirating each time, and then doing repeat cytology and how the How's that looking? The bugs are gone, the neutrophils are looking healthier. Good. And I think it's about two mils or so that I'm getting back, then I go, okay, I'm gonna pull it. Two mils per 24 hours or two mils per drain? Two mils a kilo. Per 24? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, so um, I think that's kind of pyothorax. Does anyone have any questions? Can I I just um, remember reading somewhere that um, cats, for whatever reason, are more likely to get a pleuritis and fibrin forming, uh, like long-term mm. scarring than dogs are. So we have to jump on this sort of thing a lot quicker. I mean, obviously we do anyway. And obviously sometimes we don't have the luxury of that because they don't present to us until they've got 180, 200 mils in there and they're ready to yeah. sneak and they don't actually realise this. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was interesting that there is some differences between um, long-term problems and scarring in cats and dogs. Absolutely. And I think you're exactly right. I think it's the duration that the disease has been present for. Mm. Before. Because they're not athletic and they can hide their symptoms until exactly. it's really bad. Yeah. And also because what, what's the most common cause of pyothorax in dogs? Well, in Wagga, grass seeds. Right. I don't know the rest of the world. Um, so on grass seeds then, what's the most likely bacterial population in there? Oh, I should know this. Uh, um, mixed anaerobes, they usually were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't remember the organisms, but there were all sorts of strange ones. Yeah. Um, they're branching, filamentous, not fungal. Uh, Nacardia. Good. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah Nacardia was. was that's a good guess. So that's um, found on grass. So it's in introduced from the grass seed. Mm. So that's where that organism comes from usually. So if you were to grow a Nacardia or have a Nacardia suspected on your cytology, then you go, you go looking for the grass seed, essentially. Right. Okay. Um, so maybe it's that, I mean, with cat, so the other, the other cause in dogs is extension of pneumonia and because dogs get aspiration pneumonia so much more commonly than cats do, pythorax because of that is more common. Mm -hmm. Um, so I suspect the dogs present almost before the pythorax develops a lot of the time. So they're there for their pneumonia. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not so much that they're clinical for their pyothorax. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore the fluid's just been bathing the lungs for a shorter amount of time. But the fibrosing pleuritis in cats is a really big problem. Mm -hmm. Not so much pyothorax, but chylothorax cats. We see it quite commonly. Mm -hmm. um, any questions on pyothorax? Can I just 
sorry, cats are my love and my passion. Okay. Can I throw in there, if I saw this in my febrile cat, I'd have to have FIP on my list as well if we're talking about infectious disease. Obviously, cytology is going to differentiate that for you, but... Oh, you'd hope so, but... Yeah. Do you want to tell them about major? <laughs> yeah, we've had one that we haven't been able to document. Um, I think Max had one that he hasn't... Mm. I'm not sure if you had trouble documenting it, but we couldn't get... We got negative on like immunofluorescence and immunocytochemistry and everything, but everything else is pointing towards it regarding things like globulins and okay. uh, globulin weight ratio. So you're going to give him remdesivir as a treatment trial and there's yeah. your diagnosis if he reports Yeah, he's had three, he had three days of it and he's gone home. Hey, great. Yay. Well done. Gone home. Yeah, my yeah. one is still going. Oh, you're no. <laughs> oh, Max. Sorry, Max. Tell us. Uh, I think it's like two weeks already, but it, it, it had to come back like almost every seven days for a drain. But initially it's every second day. Okay. So, so I, I hope it's getting better. Um, so you started on the room remdesivir? Yes, I did, yeah. What, did you ever get any more clarification? Did you get um, any diagnostics come back? Confirmed? No, yeah, I can't see like a granulometer structure that I can biopsy. So it's just the fluid and the immunocytochemistry came back negative. Right, okay. But the cat was uh, like last time you recommended me to do a, a coronavirus um, antibody test that was positive. Okay, so there's definite exposure. Yep. Cool. Um, did you give that cat any debts? No, I did not. No? How, how positive was it, Max? Uh, what do you mean? Sorry. What were the figures? Like one in how many thousand? Or how many hundred? The you, mean, you mean the um the microphage and was you know the coronavirus cheetah oh no that was just a, qu a quantitative test oh okay. so it's just positive yeah okay um all right next case mm -hmm. um this is a six-year-old um, female neutered Berman who presented owned by a vet, of course, I always get weird diseases, um, presented with um, acute onset of dyspnea, pyrexia and neutropenia. What do you think of these radiographs? Like a generalized interstitial, I can't see like bronchial pattern. I agree. It's very mm. interstitial pattern. Mm. What so, was the signal went again? Sorry, Anna. The, the signal went six year old yeah. female, Steve Berman, um, who presents with dyspnea, tachypnea, and pyrexia and neutropenia. It's quite diffuse as well through all lung, lung fields, mm. um, which makes me think um, if we're talking about infectious diseases, then um, like hematogenous spread is probably up at the top. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. Is this in Australia? This is, yeah. Okay. So, so up in North Shore, okay. Yeah, so I mean, I think I'd be thinking of things like fungal organisms, so like cryptococcus, um, or um, like protozoal organisms like toxoplasma as well. Um, but I guess you've got things like bacterial infections too, mm -hmm. and then non-infectious like uh, neoplasia. But uh, yeah, it's not that. <laughs> <laughs> not today. Not today. No. Um. If we're putting neoplasia on the list, um, what else should we have on our list for a fairly diffuse, patchy? Like a pulmonary edema or a non cardiogenic pulmonary, pulmonary edema. Good, excellent. Um, okay, so let's talk about hematogenous pneumonia. So you mentioned fungal disease, um, certainly can be spread hematogenously. And certainly you would never rule it out on the basis of a radiographic pattern. 
But what sort of pattern do we typically see with fungal disease, fungal pneumonias? Granulomas. Yeah, yep, good. Hmm. So often it's more nodular in appearance than this is. And I wouldn't say that this is not nodular. It's a little bit nodular, but um, certainly fungal's on my list, but it's a little bit more kind of pneumonitis-y, like really quite diffuse um, than I would typically expect with fungal. Um, what other, you mentioned toxo, did you? Yes, good. Um, and hematogenous bacterial pneumonia being the most common. What about, there's a couple of other infectious diseases that could cause this. Like lungworm? Great, yeah. Parasitism? Yeah, excellent. Um, so there's a couple of different worms, so lungworms one. Heartworm. Um, heartworm, excellent, good. Um, and the other one I won't talk to you to get out of you, but visceral larval migraines. Oh, yeah. Um, is one. So potentially if there's intestinal worms and um, larval migraines through the lungs, you can get a reaction like this. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so this cat is on a raw meat diet. Um, does that ring any alarm bells? Yeah, like so, excellent um so it's 100 percent indoors but this is a this is a real case that's still kind of a work in progress so um any hints help me out um <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, can we ask for retroviral testing it's yeah neutropenic yeah absolutely so both negative if you'll be in um and we've, have we sent off toxotitis? We're sending off toxotitis. They've actually come back negative now in this case, which is very frustrating. But hmm. um, Can, Could dry FIP look like this? Yeah, absolutely. And again, that's a really good point. Absolutely. Um, but more typically granulomas. So more typically just a little bit more nodular looking than this. This is just so diffuse. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit more kind of pat patchy and nodular. But that's such a generalisation. There's so much grey area and overlap between them. Um, Can they have those uh, eosinophilic bronchial pneumonia or something like that? Good. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, again, a lot of grey area. It tends to be a little bit more bronchial and or granulomatous, like um, lumpy. Um, but certainly can be quite diffuse, particularly in cats like eosinophilic disease. Um, could certainly look like this. Um, if this was, say, a eight-month-old Cavalier King Charles, would we have anything else on our list? Uh, heart failure. Yeah. No. <laughs> Just yeah. guessing. Because it's a cavi. <laughs> I was thinking infectious diseases though, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> Not sure, Anna. <laughs> um, so um, there's an organism called pneumocystis, um, which is it was thought to be a protozoa and it's just been reclassified as a fungal organism. And so it, it belongs in a kind of genus of its own. Um, but cavaliers have some sort of genetic immunodeficiency, which means they're very predisposed to pneumocystis infection and any other immunocompromised patient is potentially um, predisposed, but it causes an interstitial pneumonitis. Um, so very kind of diffuse interstitial pattern. <laughs> Um, so I think um, Alison's comment about the um, viral retroviral testing, we should put viral on our differential list. What viruses might cause a pneumonitis like this? We've said FIP. Mm -hmm. There's one more big one. Maybe influenza. 
Uh, in a, in a on dog, a cat, yeah. Yeah, in a dog for sure. I don't know if there are cat influencers. I should know that. Mm, but I don't I, think there are, but I, there might be, but I've not heard of them. What yeah. about Khaleesi virus? Yes, excellent. Great. So Khaleesi, in 5% of cats, Khaleesi will cause pulmonary changes as well as upper respiratory changes. And then there's that awful systemic Khaleesi form that can get, um, that will cause like pneumonitis, pancreatitis, vasculitis in all of the organs. Um, has anybody seen that? No, thankfully. No. <laughs> no, it's terrible. We had, I don't know if you can hear me because I'm in the car, but we had um, some cases of that through the pound at Collaroy. Yeah. Um, and we had to have a big overhaul of disinfecting and cleaning. They basically all all died or were euthanized yeah. and had a um, really, really profound um, vasculitis, mm. the main clinical sign, and mild um, respiratory signs associated with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Awful. So their main presenting sign in, in these patients that they wouldn't really present for their respiratory signs. Normally it's pyrexia and anorexia and the respiratory signs are sort of detected secondary. Um, and they quite often get swollen feet and foot pad and mucocutaneous junction changes associated with their vasculitis. Um, but you sort of think the degree of inflammation at their extremities and at their mucocutaneous junctions is the same as what's this antibody antigen complex. Um, deposition in the small vessels is exactly what's happening in the lungs as well. Um, so that vasculitis pattern. Um, and on that, anything really that causes vasculitis could potentially cause changes like this. Um, so that sort of airway syndrome, um, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, anything that causes that could potentially cause this pattern, including the infectious diseases. Um, so this cat's toxo-negative. It didn't have any parasites. Um, we did a airway wash and also actually aspirated the lungs with ultrasound guidance into one of the kind of consolidated areas. Um, and it came back with granulomatous inflammation. So with macrophages predominantly with a few neutrophils, but predominantly macrophages. Um, and we've never got to the bottom of what's caused it, but obviously it's owned by a vet, so it's going to be complicated, but it's mm. clearly antibiotic responsive. So I put this cat on TMS for potential toxo plus hematogenous pneumonia. And we took it off TMS once the toxotitis came back. And within a few days, the neutropenia came back. So it went from being neutropenic to neutrophilic and then normalised on the antibiotics and then stopped the antibiotics and the neutropenia came back and the pyrexia came back and the respiratory distress came back. So this cat's got some sort of strange circulating bacteria, which is responsive to TMS, presumably. Um, obviously, it could still be toxo and it could be quite an acute infection and it hasn't seroconverted yet. So we're going to do a, another titer in a couple of weeks to see where it's up to. Mm. I'll keep you, keep you posted. Yeah, thanks. Interesting. Mm. Now, how did that cat present? Was it quite dyspneic? Yes, yeah, very, yeah. Do you know who this is, Josh? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I just realised, like, about yeah. five, four, uh, ten seconds ago. Me too, yeah. Um, uh, all right, well, we might wrap up having covered most of the lower respiratory tract. Um, thanks everyone for coming. It was great. Thank, thank, you, thank, you. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Thanks guys. Cheers. Thanks, Anna. Bye. 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 Thank you.